The Mac Observer's Mac Geek Ab, episode 736 for Monday, November 19th, 2018. <laughs> Welcome to the Mac Observer's Mac Geek Gab, the show where we take all of your questions, all of your tips of all of our tips, all of your cool stuff found, all of our cool stuff found. We mix it all together. We mash it up. It's like potatoes, right? Because you take all the yummy ingredients and you put them in and you get mashed potatoes and they're delicious because you, you add some butter, maybe a little salt, you know, some seasonings here and there. Maybe you maybe you cook it in the new instant pot that you got, right? Because that thing's awesome. And it's delicious. And it's a delicious meal of learning and engagement and enjoyment uh, and all of those things and other meant words that maybe are made up and maybe are not. With the goal being that each and every one of us learns at least Five new things every time we get together, including some new words that may or may not have existed before. Sponsors for this episode include Ops Genie, now from Atlassian at OpsGenie.com. BB Edit from Bare Bones Software. Hopsy, a new one for us at TryHopsy.com slash MGG. And yes, Cashfly has some new things for us to tell you about that we are happy to do. In fact, we're happy to tell you about all of it, but we'll do that in a moment here for the moment in Durham, New Hampshire. I'm Dave Hamilton. And here in Fairfield, Connecticut, this is John F. Ron. Just had to swallow your last bite of potatoes. Those mashed potatoes are delicious, aren't they, John? Uh, I think we're probably going to do like a green bean casserole instead. Oh, you can do both. That's the beauty of Thanksgiving. So we have Thanksgiving coming up here in the in the in the states, as probably everyone listening knows, whether you live here in the states or not. But that's this week. So, yeah, yeah, a little bit of feasting, a little bit of family time. It's I think Thanksgiving's my favorite of the holidays because it's like there's no gifts or anything that you have to obsess about, and you just get together. Yeah, just and, stuff your face and have some uh, maybe some adult beverages and quality uh, family uh, time. Yeah, and and cool. don't forget to talk about politics because that always brings people together at the Thanksgiving <laughs> dinner table. <laughs> no, right? but you know you can talk tech, and maybe that's a safer topic. That's so, much less controversial, I think. Yeah. So, uh, but there are always conflicts, and that brings us to Scott's. Uh, I don't want to. Well, it's a tip. It's a warning. He said, guys, I just discovered something. I have multiple Macs, don't we all? Uh, and he says, my iMac is maxed out on its OS as El Capitan. Same. I have one in the house that's maxed out on that as well. He says, my MacBook Pro is on High Sierra, also maxed out. And he says, I have uh, iWorks, Numbers, Pages, Keynote on both. Until the most recent update, which he said for him happened automatically on November 8th, the data files work across the versions. Now... They do not. He says, when I try to open a numbers document on my El Capitan machine that I had edited on my High Sierra machine, it now says it's time to update to open this spreadsheet. You'll need the latest version of numbers and it offers to bring you to the app store. But of course, that version of numbers is not available for El Cap and boom, you are out of luck. So a warning to all of us that uh, that might find ourselves in that position. So is there a way to, 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 to downgrade? You can probably export as a prior numbers version. I have not run into this yet. Uh, we just got Scott's note in today, so I haven't had time to experiment with this. But, um, but it, it does not surprise me that this would happen. I mean, it's, it, it, you know, you can't maintain the file format forever. And who knows? Maybe there's a little patch coming that well, might well, fix sure this. Well, sure you can. It almost sounds to me like a bug that they should not have. Um... Perhaps. Yeah. Perhaps. I recommend, if you need to, I recommend jumping to LibreOffice. Um, I, I, it's not as smooth and nice as numbers, for sure. But um, but if you need something that's truly cross-platform and, and won't do something that'll surprise you, um, I've been really blown away by LibreOffice lately. So I'm not, it's not replacing pages or numbers for me, but it is replacing Excel and Word. So there you go. Yeah. 
The other thing I'm, I'm looking on one of my machines here when I need to. So uh, of course there's open office. That's another. Uh, well, so LibreOffice is, is an open office. It is part of the, or it is a descendant of the open office suite. I don't know Got what it. the right word is. It is just the one branch that, or a, yeah, maybe a branch, but it, it is, it is a version of the open office suite that is perhaps the best one in terms of its Mac OS look and feel and integration and all that. So it is a, a feature for feature file format for file format, Microsoft office clone that, um, that is, you know, built for all platforms, Linux, windows, Mac, you name it. And, uh, I guess I did name it those three and, uh, it, that's open office. And then LibreOffice is, is the one, one flavor of that. And it's, for the Mac, it's the best one I've tried. It and it really works well. I'm blown away by it. So, so there you go. There you go. Uh, all right. Moving on. Right. Moving on from that. Larry has a. Uh, Larry has a a tip for us that uh, that Eero helped him with, and now I've lost Larry. How did we lose Larry? Oh, there it is. Oh, I just lost it. I see him. He says, uh, I use Eero for mesh Wi-Fi in my house, and they recently gave or added the ability to see the number of inspections on a per device basis. That's if you're using Eero Plus. He says, uh, I'm attaching a screenshot. He says, and you'll note that a Vizio device, which he says is my TV, is up there at 135,000, and that the next in line is my Amazon Echo device with a mere 40,000. Says the Vizio, of course, a TV, but it, we don't use it as a smart TV. And he says, I did not want to use it to provide content to me from the web. I use an Amazon Fire TV device in its place, but I did give the Vizio access to the web for a firmware update. But now it seems to be talking all the time. He says, when I saw this data, I looked into the preferences screen of the TV and I did not see a way to control this behavior. I thereupon decided to reset the device, the device to its factory settings. And when I started uh, to set it up again, I found I could not get the Wi-Fi connection screen to enable without giving them permission to use automatic content recognition and report such to Google. If this is not evil, I do know, not know what it is uh, for it to access to the web. I have to give a third party to whom I use no services, all of my viewing habits and data, and then they can do with it what they want. He says, I decided to deny the TV rights to access the Internet. Uh, he says, I use an external device to provide content and the inspections from Vizio have now gone to zero. He says, people ought to know how their TV viewing habits are being monitored, shared and monetized by third parties without their explicit permission. Shame on them. That's very interesting. Well, I'm sure it's buried in the EULS. Of course. The, uh, yes, of course. Yeah. But, you know, that's it, it's not a good cool. point. So believe it or not, Dave, uh, the devices in my entertainment center that could be networked. So Blu-ray player is the one. I think they have this thing called Blu-ray Live where yeah. it can do something similar, can reach out and get, you know, additional content and make your, your life wonderful. And and the same with TVs. The thing is, I intentionally wanted to buy a dumb, dumb, dumb TV that only did TV and none of the smart stuff because I don't want my TV to be smart or my Blu-ray Blu -ray player to be smart for exactly this reason. Yeah, right? well, you're, but your TiVo is smart and your TiVo is sharing all that data. So uh, that's okay, but I know it is right. That's and true. It, Fair. Right. Hmm. Yeah. Eyes wide open. Yep. Yep. But it was Fair. just an effort when, when I, you know, upgraded my TV, all the ones that they had on display, there were only like two models that didn't have the word smart in them. And it's like, well, that's, that's the one I want. I so here's, here's TV the thing. Um, it, it, you, I think now would be hard pressed to find something that's truly marketed as a TV to, uh, to to not have any of those smart features like it's just baked into these things. However, I do want to point out that there if you take the smart features out of a TV, there is often very, very, very little difference between a TV and what we would call a monitor, right, that you would plug into your computer. We use HDMI for both same nowadays, thing, right? Much, it's right? the same thing. So. Uh, so if you don't want a smart TV, you might be able to save a ton of money and just go get like a good piece of glass that has just an HDMI input and use that and you're good to go. 
In fact, John, it's funny that you mention this because further down in the agenda, which we will jump to now, I found a cool thing recently. So we have in our house, we have our, uh, you know, in the living room, we've got the, the big TV. We've got, it's like a, I don't know, 60 inch plasma or something. And, uh, and you know, we have our TV on our Apple TV and all of that stuff plugged in there and it works great from the kitchen. However, we cannot see, uh, the TV in the living room. Most of the time that's fine, but there are times when we might want that content also visible simultaneously in the kitchen. For example, every year when we watch the Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade, but also if we have like a football game on or something, it's kind of nice to be able to sort of, you know, wander between the two rooms and maybe cook some, get some dinner going or whatever in the kitchen while you got the game sort of like idly on in the background. You can just sort of check in on it, whatever. And I've wanted to solve this problem for a while. And the folks at IO Gear have a product that does so. It is their wireless 4K video extender with local pass through. So it's not a very sexy product name, but it's a very descriptive product name. And that's all you need. Uh, you take the HDMI cable that plugs into the TV. So it doesn't matter what switch boxes you have or what that mess looks like. You've got one cable going to the TV. You take that. You plug that into the switch box or into the, sorry, not the switch box into the transmitter of this IO gear kit. And then the other, uh, you take another HDMI cable, which it comes with and plug that into your TV. So it's just a pass through. Doesn't mess with the signal. Everything's fine. Doesn't delay it. Everything's golden. Then there's a second unit that you put wirelessly up to 150 feet away and it transfers over five gigahertz. So, you know, bear all that in mind. And so I have a 27 inch mono price display that I got for like 300 bucks. And I put that in the kitchen and I plug this device into it and I plug them both into electrical power and that's it. Now it mirrors the sink. It, like, I think they say the latency on it is, I mean, it's gotta be less than 50 milliseconds. Like you just don't notice it. They, they say that it's less than 200 milliseconds of latency um, if it's, I, I, I don't think it's that much. I think it's much less than that. And it just works. I, I mean, it, like, I gotta be honest when I, I know that this is what this device is built to do. And my wife was laughing at me because I was like, there's no way this is going to work because it's exactly what we want. And it would be great if it worked. And so therefore it's just going to be a headache and a disaster. And it's going to take me four times to try and get this thing right. And she's like, well, it says it's going to do what, what you want. Why, why would you expect it not to? I'm like, because I know how technology works. It's just like, this is too simple. And uh, I plugged it in and it worked. It, it's great. Transfers sound across it. Good to go. Uh, we actually use Sonos for our sound. So I just mirror the sound with Sonos, but you, you don't have to. You could take the sound out of the HDMI signal and good to go. Mm -hmm. So the IO Gear wireless 4K video extender. I'll put a link, of course, in the in the show notes. But um, so it sounds like it handles, as pointed out by KiwiGram in our chat room. And where is our chat room? It's at macgeekgab.com slash stream. That's correct. Right. That's correct. But KiwiGram points out that uh, some devices, less capable devices, um, there's this evil thing called HDCP. You sure. Have heard of. Yeah. And apparently this handles that HDCP is high definition copy protection, and it's something to protect a digital data stream. And. I think it does it over HDMI, and I guess that's correct. Over, and your device as well. Yep. Uh, so apparently, it carries that because they're they're terrified that you know people are going to suck down the you know pristine digital content and and make a copy it world, of it. I guess. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's right. It's like, that, well, it's happening yeah. anyways. You know. Sorry, guys. But right. Yeah. But this 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 maintains that security in such a way that nothing seems to yell, which is which is all you need. So yeah. It's really, it, it's, it's quite, I mean, we've only had it for, you know, a couple of days, but we are very much looking forward to checking it out with the uh, Thanksgiving day parade. And, and the next time we have a Patriots game to watch or something like just, you know, actually uh, yesterday morning, uh, Sunday morning, I had, we were doing some chores around the house and we'll put on music to do that. But I put on uh, a concert video of a rush concert. And just turned that on on the both TVs and and then also streamed it with Sonos to all the speakers in the house. And it was like, this is perfect. It was great. <laughs> just to feel like I'm, I'm living in the future. 
Now, I'm curious if you've tried this, because it sounds like this may work, but have you run the TV app on iOS? Mm-hmm. Oh, okay. Yeah. I mean, I, we have an Apple TV, and... but... Well, no, but the TV app, it looks like it looks like I could watch shows. Well, I could do it through my TiVo as well, I think. Sure. Yes, so I could do it through the TiVo app, but it looks like the TV app here, once I told it that I'm with Optimum, it's like, oh, and by the way, um, you got these channels, right? Absolutely. So I think if I wanted to, I could watch my show on my iPad or my... Uh, I think they introduced it in you know the latest iOS. Uh, I think it was iOS 11, but yes. Yeah. Yeah, it was. It's been there for a year. I'm pretty sure, but yeah, no, it works great. Yeah. Okay. So I'm yeah. thinking if the channel is exposed, that that could be a, a you know, when you have a large eye device, that could be another option. It could. I but what I wanted was a a mirror. Uh, like I wanted whatever's on right, that right. TV to be on this one in perfect sync. Like I didn't want to have to. But you're right. Yes, you could. You could just put an Apple TV up and and stream to that too for sure. Yep. Yeah, it's pretty cool. I'm pretty stoked about it. So. Anyway, just wanted to share my uh, my cool stuff. Oh, found. Wait, are you saying that the TV app is married to the Apple TV somehow? No, is that I'm that? saying this IO gear thing mirrors my things. And that's what I, I wanted, see. which is why okay. like yes. you can with the Apple TV. OK, I get it. Yes. Yeah, you cannot do this with like if you have two Apple TVs, you can't have mm -hmm. them both display the same thing in I sync. Know. Right. It, right. TiVo should be able to do this with their their TiVo mini. Right. Because it streams its content anyway from the the main source. You should like, and uh, you know, I said to my son, they should be able to do this. And he's like, well, yeah, right. All the text there. He's like, they just haven't turned that on in the software yet. I'm like, yes, mm -hmm. that's correct. Mm -hmm. Yep. So yeah, it's pretty good. Nice. It's fun living in the future. So, uh, all right. John has a quick tip to share. He says, uh, I fixed my home folder permissions dozens of times on various computers, but I got one recently that had some if issues after I set the owner and they still couldn't write to their desktop. After a little Google foo, I found I had no idea about the new command line follow up from Apple using disk utility in the terminal to correct permissions. And it is we'll put this in the show notes, of course, but it's disk util reset user permissions. And then you do the slash and a couple of other things it says I, I found it in a support article, which, of course, we will also link to. So, yeah, very cool that you can uh, you can you can reset user permissions from uh from disk utility on the command line now which is a pretty good thing that's uh it's nice to see them not quite hiding that from us anymore so good stuff right yeah i think that comes up a lot of times especially when you do a, a system migration we've had people mention that exactly uh, yeah yeah i can't i can't i'm i'm the owner and i can't get into my home folder it's like Yep. I think you, before you had, you, you used to have to go into, uh, well, you could you go into run something crazy from, uh, from recovery, I think. And then that went away too. So I'm glad that this is back. Yeah. I think mm -hmm. that was even gone. Like you could, you just couldn't do it. Cause they're like, Oh, why would you need to re you know, do a permissions repair? It's like, well, because this maybe that, but it's cool. Mm -hmm. You guys know best. Thank you. All right. Uh, let's go to, yeah, let's do David. David, uh, we have, we have two ways of moving the cursor first on iOS, second on Mac OS. So, uh, listener, David says, I recently found out by mistake, a feature of iOS, and I had no idea it was there. Now I'm going to point out, this is a feature we've talked about before, but David describes how to invoke it in a way that I find to be the best description of that I've ever heard. The feature is if you properly press on the iPhone or on the iOS keyboard, iPhone or iPad, the keyboard will like the labels on the keys will fade away to gray. And now you can drag your finger around and use the iOS keyboard, the space where the iOS keyboard was as a trackpad to move your cursor around. So for example, if you're editing an email, you want to move things around, you just push and it was a, either a 3d touch push or the right kind of hold your mouth, just right push. And you can invoke this. And then you've got a trackpad that lets you move the cursor around, which is very, very cool. Here's how David describes it. He says the new way is to press and hold the space bar on the iOS keyboard and then roll or move your finger. 
This is the simplest way to do this. It works every time. Yep. It works on my iPhone XR, which, of course, is does not have 3D touch. It's just flawless and fluid and smooth. So push on and hold on the space bar, and that will do exactly what you want. It's great. David, you, you perfectly uh, encapsulated the way to do this. So very cool. Pretty good, huh? Right, John? Yeah, it's kind of creepy how it blanks out the keyboard, though. It, it is. It feels like ghosty. Yeah, I'm with you. I'm with you. Yeah. Yeah, but that's how it goes. All right, here's another one. If uh, if if you're ready for me to blow you away. So this one's from the Mac Geek Cab forums at macgeekab.com slash forums uh, from listener Alpha Man, who says the best trackpad gesture on the Mac is not found in system preferences trackpad. It's in accessibility. So let's go into accessibility, select mouse and trackpad on the left, then trackpad options on the right. Then click the or check the box next to enable dragging with three finger drag. Now that you've turned that on, move to a window. There's no need to click. Just put three fingers on your trackpad when you're over the window handle at the top. And now the window moves. He says, OK, maybe it's not the best. He says, but I sure like it. I like it, too. This is great. I'm I'm not a multi gesture kind of person, but I hate clicking and dragging on a trackpad. It's just a weird, th I don't know why, it's just a weird thing. I always like feel like I'm pushing too hard and all of this. You don't have to worry about it anymore. Third finger down, boom, just drag it around. Good to go. Thank you so much, Alpha Man. You rock. It's good stuff. You like that, John? I don't like that it's buried. Well, Inside yeah, that's the, that's the thing is, right? We always talk about, both, and this is true on iOS as well, that the accessibility features are, you know, or the accessibility section is the place where so much of this stuff is. It's crazy. While we're on the subject of the Mac Geek Gab forums, um, we know, I know we've talked about this, but we have, well, if you're in the live stream, what I'm about to say is not true, but for most of you, this will be true. We have now closed the Mac Geek Gab Facebook group. And here's the thing. Yeah, I know. Uh, and I wanted to do this after we could, I wanted to talk about why in the episode here, because of why we're doing it. The Mac Geek Up Facebook group is a great thing. Um, it, it really has been, it still is, uh, or was, uh, there are, it's a great resource to go and get information and get help, but it has nothing to do with Mac Geek Up. It is Facebook's users using it. And most of the people in the group have never listened to the show, don't know anything about the show and aren't really a part of our community. They're part of Facebook's community. This is not a surprise. This is not necessarily a bad thing. It's just not something we need in our world. It offers no benefit to us. We don't get listeners from it. Uh, it gets to be a confusing thing. There's a management headaches with it. And it makes more sense for us to have our own community that is, you know, part of our world. Now, will there be people? Are there people in the Mac Geek Gab forums that are not Mac Geek Gab listeners? Yes, that's fine. But we're not just getting drive by traffic from Facebook. And and to be fair, you know, drive, there's nothing wrong with drive by traffic, but um, but it's not ours. There's no there's no benefit to the Mac Geek Gab family here to have this group over there with our name on it that really is just a odd conglomeration of folks. So the reason that uh, that I wanted to talk about this here is because I don't want to bother explaining it over there. I'm just going to tell people to listen to the episode. Those of you that do both will already know and probably are already participating in the forums. Keeping up with that has almost become a full-time job. <laughs> it's great how much traffic we have in the forums now. But... Uh, that's why I wanted to do this here, because this is our home. And now we have our home that's our home and we do it exactly the way we want, where we can have answers to questions and we can mark them solved and we can search and sort and categorize them the way that we as a, as a community and a family want to. So this is why we've shut down the Facebook group. And I just wanted to quickly go through that. Do you have anything to add? Do you have anything to add, John? No, I'm with you. I mean, the Facebook group, I mean, 
number one, you got to be on Facebook and not everybody's on Facebook or wants to be on Facebook. So. Right. Right. Exactly. Exactly. And, and yeah. it's under our control. Correct. Correct. And I mean, the, the, the bad news for Facebook is that you won't have to look at the ads that I'm sure they throw up every now and then. Right. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah, you that's right. Well, you can look at our stuff. ads. Yeah, exactly. No, no, no. It's true. It's true. It's just our place. Yep. And we can, and there's nothing, the, the other issue is like, that's not our site. Facebook is, is someone else's site, right? So they can make changes there anytime they want. And they, we may or may not like those. They may or may not work for us. There are things that we would like to change about the way Facebook's groups work. And of course we can't because they're not ours, but we can with our own forums. And that's what we've been doing for several months. So I want to throw a huge shout out out to not only, uh, of course, all the people that have been helping us in the forums, all the people that have been participating and Alex and Graham who have been moderating our forums. We probably will need another moderator or two and we'll let that happen organically as, as some of you sort of percolate up. There's already some ideas that we have, but, um, so a huge thank you to everybody that's that's gotten the forums up to where they are. And also a huge thank you to the folks like Alex and Brian and Michael, who've been really helping and really helped us build the Facebook group as well. Uh, we did put a lot of effort into that at first, and it's just become obvious that it's, you know, that we've moved past that. So thank you to everybody and, and a good yeah. thing. So. And it's nice software, too. It is. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. exactly. What is it? WP? WP 4 Yeah. Yeah. F O R U? No, F O R O. W P four O is the software we use. So Yeah, um, but I, I'm I'm impressed with all of the uh all of the features in there. It's pretty good. Yeah. It's um it's interesting. It's it the the core forum engine of WP four O is free. And then for like little features like if you want private messaging, you pay, you know, twenty bucks a year or something. I mean it's it's the prices are trivial, but that's how that's their business model. It's like, okay, look, here's this great, you know, foundation. And then the things you want to add, you know, that's where they make their money. And it's great. And we paid for all that stuff and turned it all on. And we've got a, a really nice, robust system that's constantly being updated. And we're really happy with it. Yeah, it's pretty good. So we had a we had a spam issue this weekend. The, you know, their spam filter kind of has a way to yeah. tune it where you can. Yeah, where you can I set that there were there were a lot of posts to our uh, Twitter feed, I think. Right. I went through Is and cleaned all was? those up. Yep. 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 Okay. Cause yeah, I, I, I clean a few out as well too. Cool. Like, Thank what you. Is, what is all this? Stuff? <laughs> yeah. I, clean, it, 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 I saw it in my Twitter feed that there were, would appear to be spam posts. And yep. uh, by the time I got to them on my client, they had almost all of them had disappeared, but um, yeah, yeah I, had the, I had the forums sort of echoing to several places, including our, our Twitter feed, which is, you know, mm -hmm. okay, fine. But it was great because having these spammers constantly attack us for like three days allowed us to really tweak exactly where we wanted to set our, our spam thresholds and stuff. And now I think we've got it. It's, I think it's perfect, but of course there's no thing perfect. It'll, it'll, we'll need to continue to tweak, but it's all good. It's all good. So again, Thank you to everybody. And uh, we look forward to seeing you on the, on the forums and all that stuff. John, I want to take a minute and talk about our, uh, our first two sponsors. If I, uh, if I may. Uh, of course. Of course. All right. Our first sponsor is Ops Genie by Atlassian. If you're listening to this show, you know that incidents with technology really incidents of any kind are inevitable. And really it comes down to how you and how your company respond to them that separates you from everybody who's not as good as you. And here's the thing, any tricks that you can use to make yourself better in this regard are a good thing. In fact, they're not tricks. They're just tools. That's what Ops Genie is. It is a tool that lets you plan for your service disruptions and to stay in control during incidents. It gives your team the power to respond quickly and efficiently to unplanned issues. We've talked about this. Are there planned issues? Maybe, but they're generally not surprises. It helps you to notify all the right people through a smart combination of scheduling and escalation paths that take into account things like time zones and holidays so that Say the people in London can be the ones to handle things on Thanksgiving because you're stuffing your face full of turkey here in the USA, right? 
Like you can factor that stuff in. It's smart enough. Ops Genie knows how to deal with this stuff. And it integrates deeply with all kinds of different things because Atlassian is there. That doesn't just mean it integrates with everything that Atlassian has. This means that Ops Genie integrates with so many different things because Atlassian is an open company like this. They truly understand that you need to use the tools that you need to use and they make things work. Ops Genie is so cool and it's already saved our butts here at Mac Geek Gab. It can save yours too. With Ops Genie, your next incident doesn't stand a chance. Visit OpsGenie.com to sign up to get a free company account that lets you add up to five team members. Yes, free, no credit card, no nothing, just your five people and some peace of mind. That's OpsGenie.com. Never miss a critical alert again with OpsGenie. Our thanks to who? OpsGenie by Atlassian for sponsoring this episode. Our next sponsor is BB Edit from Barebones Software at barebones.com. BB Edit 12.5 came out this month and now includes basic language support for Swift. Yes, Swift. A new commands dot 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 command that provides rapid access to BB Edit's many menu commands, which is pretty cool to be able to use. A new lorem ipsum generator if you need to put some sample text out somewhere. Extensive internal improvements to improve performance and compatibility and enhancements to many of BB Edit's well-known features, including one of my favorites, which is multi-file search. Also, what's another one of my favorites? Anybody that's listened to me knows. Find differences. These are two things that make BB Edit so awesome. Do you have a folder full of stuff and you're wondering how to find the one file in there that has a reference to the piece of code or the instruction that you're calling and you don't want to go to the command line and use grep? Well, BB Edit is your answer. Multi-file search, you can throw a folder at it, boom. You can have it search all of your open files. They don't have to necessarily all be stored in the same place. If you've got them open, just tell BB Edit to search all of them. You're golden. It's so awesome. I, it, I couldn't live without this tool. And I don't just say that because this is a sponsorship. I say it because it's true. And I happen to be saying it in the sponsorship message because it's true really just go check it out. You can download it. You get a 30 day trial of all the features in BB edit. And if you find that you don't need the paid features, well, guess what? BB edit is free to use most of its features, probably the ones that matter to you. So go check it out. BB edit from barebones.com. Our thanks to barebones and BB edit for sponsoring this episode. All right, John. Another cool stuff found from uh, listener Joe now is actually an app that I use all the time in preparing Mac Geek Gab. It's a little known fact. Astute listeners have picked up on it that I pre record many of our sponsor spots to make sure I get them right and tight and good so that I don't ramble on and you folks get the right message without uh, me stumbling on things. I can really focus on it. It's good. But I have to edit those. And what app do I use? Well, that's where Joe's suggestion comes in. He says, I know you often mention Rogue Amoeba's Audio Hijack Pro, which is awesome, as you always say. But he says, I'd like to give a heads up to Fission. He says, I wanted a simple audio editor and Fission is it. It's super easy to pick up, very powerful in what you can do with it in terms of making complicated things quick and easy. I can now edit and produce files for a podcast. I help out with much quicker than before when I used GarageBand. He says chapterized MP3 files work with alternate artwork for the chapters. And it's now a 30 second job with drag and drop. Yeah, you're right. I don't do our chapters with this. I do our chapters with a different tool called Auphonic, but, um, but Fission will do podcast tap chapters, but it just makes editing easy. And the cool part is it does the editing Usually, as long as the files are the right format, in a non-destructive way. So you can non-destructively edit an MP3 without having to recompress the file, which is pretty darn cool. I always use it if we like last week, I don't I think I mentioned it in the show that I really screwed up and kept chopping the audio file at the wrong spots, like while we were recording. And I had to stitch it all together and and uh Fission did a great job with it. So no. 
No. Do they do they name it differently across the pond? Because I suspect that our friend is from across the pond. Because first he opened up his email with high chaps, but he also called it fusion instead of fission. No, it, that's which a, are two a, forms of nuke. And, and you corrected it. I yeah. just thought it was kind of interesting. Yeah. No, no. It's <laughs> it's wait, called fusion. Fission. Or fission? It's yes. called fission. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Yeah. So if I had to select a nuclear technology, I, I think fusion is is what we really want, right? Uh sure. <laughs> well, I think the sun is 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 nuclear fusion, whereas nuclear reactors, I think, are fission, right? And they create all this waste, and it's just terrible. Uh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> all right. There you go. Sure. Sure. I guess. <laughs> I know it's not in the nuclear geek gab. <laughs> no, it's it, we we take just jumped out We've taken me. worse detours, my friend. This is this is not a problem. Uh, I just am not prepared for this one. So you, you're on your own. Yeah. <laughs> uh, listener Eric, last week we talked about I, the fact that I went to the Mac Tech conference and and how much I liked it. And he says, uh, Mac tech conferences are great, but not easily accessible for those of us living in other parts of the world. Fortunately, he says there exist similar conferences around the globe. And he says, uh, tidbits, uh, the folks, the uh, Adam and Tanya angst who actually were at and spoke at, uh, at Mac tech says they maintain a list of some of the larger ones. So we will put that list in the show notes. So tidbits list of conferences, and there you go. Now it's in the show notes. Uh, he says, I regularly attend the Mac sysadmins uh, conference, sysadmin conference in Gothenburg for some great presentations by some of the brightest minds in the Mac community, including the 2018 APFS session by Tim Standing, which Dave praised in MGG 735. Yeah. Uh, he says for an even deeper dive, Jonathan Levin of Mac OS internals gave a presentation on APFS deep internals. He says the best part is that almost all Mac sys admin sessions are recorded and available for all to enjoy. So he says, uh, head over to their uh, documentation site, which is uh, where we can see some of those. So I will put that in the show notes too. So thanks for that, Eric. Very good. Yeah. Conferences are a good thing. This is as uh, if, you know, if you're doing this for a living and, uh, and supporting folks, that is a full contact sport. It's good to get out. And uh, especially for, you know, those of us that, that do some work as sort of lone wolf consultants, it's, it's tough, right? Because I mean, you have Mac geek gab, right. As, as a community and a resource. And we certainly have uh, a lot of listeners like you and, and, uh, and, and now we have the forums where we can all sort of, you know, pool our resources together, but it's really nice to see each other in, in, in the flesh as it were, and have some fun together too. So that's where these conferences are, are a great thing. So thanks for that, Eric. Good stuff. Ready to jump to some questions, my friend? Yes. Maybe. Okay. Well, yes. then, then let's do that. All right, cool. Let's go to, uh, to Greg who writes, he says, uh, my wife passed away suddenly in September and it provided a situation where I have Mac geek questions. She and I were on an iCloud family storage plan purchased under her Apple ID. We purchased it before we were able to share storage among family members. While I may not completely delete her Apple ID, it's certainly not going to be in active use any longer. So I'd really like to switch to the monthly storage. Uh, I'd, I'd like to switch that charge to my Apple ID. We also have several other family members using this storage, so I'd rather not have to cancel her plan and start with a new plan since we have close to 200 gigs of photos, backups, uh, et cetera, already uploaded. Is there any way to do this fairly easily? Also, is there a way to transfer iTunes store credit from her Apple ID to mine? I'd gotten into the habit of getting discounted iTunes cards and keeping a credit on her Apple ID to pay for storage and on mine to pay for the Apple uh, music family subscription. And it would be simpler to just run it all through mine. Since I realized that I could just leave the storage charge on her ID until it's exhausted the, the current credit, but I really like to consolidate the storage and the Apple music monthly charges to my ID. Totally makes sense. And uh, I'm really sorry to hear about uh, your wife, my friend. That's uh, hopefully we can provide some, some guidance with the tech stuff that maybe makes life a little easier for you. Um, I, but the thing is, you know, all of this, well, really would be easier if, if there was some way to just merge I, uh, iCloud accounts. But there is no how to merge two iCloud accounts 
uh, knowledge base article because you cannot. Uh, we've even had folks call Apple about this. You cannot um, unless there's there's something along those lines. So, uh, it, you know, it's I mean, you could do something crazy like moving the music to hers and then changing the email address associated with hers to yours. And and but I think that's going to create more headache than than you need at any point in time, especially right now. Uh, honestly, I, I think you're going to have to call Apple for both of these things. There's no magic way to just like do this, but I am nearly certain that on the back end, they can do this for you. So, uh, so uh, I, th I think that's the answer in terms of your iTunes store credit. Again, while you're on the phone with Apple, I think they they'll be able to just bounce that right over to you. But I think you could buy an iTunes gift card with your iTunes store credit. So you could buy a gift card from her account and then send that to yours. Again, if that was the only thing you had to do, then that's probably the way I'd do it. But you're going to need to call Apple to sort of move some of these services around without everybody losing out. And I think, frankly, the easiest way to do that is 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 just, you know, call them and, and take care of it. So. Those are my thoughts on this. Uh, John, do you have any thoughts? I did a search and found a piece of software that claims to do this, but I've never heard of them. So, yeah, that, that, I think that was a what does it claim to do? Oh, it says, um, uh, well, you know, the title of the article is how to merge two or multiple iCloud accounts into one. Yeah, but that's just software that downloads all the data to your Mac and re-uploads it, right? I would assume that's yeah. what's involved. Yeah. That, that post is kind of a spam post. I've seen that post yeah, before. So. It's a, it's just a, <laughs> I think so too. somebody trying to sell their utility that you can't possibly merge to iCloud accounts without Apple blessing this behavior. So, yeah. Yeah. But I'm, I'm with you is that, I mean, you know, it's, it's data in databases with IDs. So, you know, in theory, if you have the right access, you can, you can merge them. I mean, yeah, but they can't. We, I mean, we they could won't. Probably, we, yeah. we could probably write the sequel to do that, right? Uh, you know, we could. A little programming project. Yeah, I wonder if Apple runs on a SQL database for that, right? Um, Dude, you'd have to. I mean, oh, the, the, no, no. The whole no SQL what? movement, man. Facebook and Twitter basically, uh -huh. you know, eradicated SQL from the planet for those kinds of things. They're totally no SQL over there because it's way faster. You know, to to not have indexes to populate and all that stuff. So yeah, it's possible. I'll put a link to the whole NoSQL thing in uh, in the oh, okay. show notes. Yeah, it's fascinating. Right. Yeah, just yeah. the the you know uh, uh, corporate level database work that I've done. They used uh, SQL just because. Well, it gives you flexibility, but then, yeah, as you point out, the uh, cost of that is performance. Correct. Not yeah, me. we we still use uh, MySQL or some variant thereof uh, for all our stuff here. I mean, it's it's still it. Th there's still a lot of people that use it. I just I, on a large scale, uh, most of those things have moved to some NoSQL um, equivalent. Okay, for those wondering, SQL is structured query language and is a language that you can use to interact with a SQL database. Yeah. It's fun stuff. You know, it you, is. Got some, got, you got some extra moments, you know, download uh, MySQL and uh, set up a database and, and go for it and learn SQL. Make right. some money. Right. <laughs> yeah, it's true. Yeah. Yeah. The, the, the idea is that SQL databases were are relational databases where you can have... Uh, you know, you might have a, a table of all your data and then a table of all your users. And in the data table, you have a user ID ass assigned to each piece of data. And so when a user says, I want to see all my data, it just does a filter on that other database that says, hey, I'm related to you. Hence the relational database term. I'm related to you. Here's the user ID of this user I want to look up. And then it returns a list of, hey, yep, here's your you know, here's all the records associated with that user without showing you everything else. It's pretty straightforward when you kind of abstract it out. Um, so, yeah. So anyway. is NoSQL a flat file database? Well, or what is it? kind of. Yeah. Yeah. All so, right. Because as Dave said, so, so in the beginning, there were something called flat file databases. You had all values um, 
defined in a single file. And right. that, that's not very efficient. But kind of what Dave said, I think, or was hinting at, is that a relational database lets you take different containers, if you will, with certain items and link them together. And there's a huge, when you think about it, there's a huge amount of power being able to do that. Mm-hmm. Um, but as you mentioned, I, I remember doing this, uh, you got to create keys and indices and, and it gets kind of squirrely to get good performance because, you know, the performance or, or sophistication like that comes at a cost. Right. Right. Exactly. Yeah. So yeah, go check this out. There's a, the MongoDB people have a, have a whole thing about no sequels. So uh, and there's various different no SQL databases you can you can use. So sounds like a movement. It no is a movement. SQL, it is no SQL. That's yeah. No, it totally is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's a thing. <laughs> it's a thing. Yeah, marching in the streets with no SQL signs. That's right. That's <laughs> right. That's right. No Roger. No SQL. No rent. All right. Uh, yeah. Cindy in Indy writes. Uh, I'm looking for a way to compare two drives, my internal SSD and my external work-related drive that's a backup. Often clients will use the same images over and over. If uh, a duplicate file exists on my backup, I want to set the color label on that SSD, on that file on the SSD to green. And then I want to back up uh, my SSD files to another drive, but don't back up the files that are labeled green. So I'm hoping then to back up the SSD without those files duplicated on the backup drive to a smaller bootable drive. And that way she kind of creates everything. She says, I have Hazel carbon copy cloner. I'm open to scripting, et cetera. So, you know, I, the, the first thing that comes to mind and I haven't done anything, I haven't done enough with Chronosync to, uh, to know if it would do it, but that that's sort of the first thing that comes to mind is, well, that, sort of intelligently lets you script and sync things. So maybe that would do it. Um, man, I don't, but I don't, I don't know of any backup. I don't know of anything. So maybe this is a geek challenge. Feedback at MacGeekGab.com if anybody has any ideas. John, do you have any ideas? One idea I have is that you could send an email to feedback at MacGeekGab.com. Right. Or uh, because it's a geek challenge, feedback at MacGeekGab.com obviously would, would be mm-hmm. another place to go. But any other thoughts for the moment or do we do um, we move this on? You know, I, I was, I mean, when I read this, my first thought was, can't Carbon Copy Cloner do this? And I think I may be able to. Yep. Well, the thing is, is that uh, Carbon Copy Cloner does have the flexibility to let you run what's known as a shell script. Before doing its thing, sure. Um, and and she said she was open to uh, scripting, so that may be a oh, that's one part true. Of it. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I was also yeah, thinking yeah. Automator. I mean, it may be kind of you know may not give you the best performance, but Automator has several Finder functions. Fair, yep. And I think you may be able to put together a sequence of things saying, okay, compare. I mean, it's going to take a really long time, though, I think. that the, 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 My struggle with oh, a task like true. this. My struggle with a task like this is that the, the, it sounds like one of the desires is to identify duplicates. Right. And most backup software, I was actually looking. I thought, that, will CCC do that? And I don't think it will, nor should it. You know, I mean, you, you're supposed to back things up, not make decisions. Yeah, that's a good point. Yep. Or maybe think outside of the box and just write a script that would just like detect, you know, get a dupe detector. What what's a good dupe detector? You know? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that'd be another uh, what is it? I'm trying to think. Was it tidy up or something? That there there are a few utilities out there that'll churn through a drive and identify duplicates and, and delete them. I wonder if that would be. No, a but you way make a good point that that especially given that one of these is an SSD. Um, like, do you, well, I guess reading from it's fine. That's not going to cause any trouble, but it is going to beat on these drives to, to scour for duplicates as, as Kiwi Grant in the, in the Graham, I should say in the chat room notes, he says, uh, I think it might be a pain down the line if your backups aren't true copies. And he says the price of storage is low enough now. Maybe, you know, like is, is, is it, is it worth it? I think is, is he's questioning the validity of the, of the request. Um, and I, I kind of get that. Like, is it really worth it 
to scour your drive all the time? I don't know. I don't know. Yeah, I mean, it could from a, you know, if if you're not using uh, a CMS, yeah, then I could understand why having multiple copies, probably different versions, right? So you're talking about like a not a not a not necessarily a CMS, but a, a version control system, a VCS. Uh, yeah. Okay. But I think a lot of CMSs do that, can do that. Uh, I, I think the intent here is that you want to avoid having two files with the same name, but they're different versions. Or right. at least right. in my mind, that's one thing I'd want to avoid. It's like you have file one and file hmm. one. Are are they identical or not? Yeah, right. <laughs> right. Right. Now, the nice thing is that Carbon Copy Cloner does do that sort of comparison. It takes it a real long time, and I actually choose to do that like once a week or something like that. It, it will actually do a bite by bite, I think, comparison and say, is what's here the same as what's there? Okay, sure. good. Yeah. Yeah. Huh. Yeah. Well, if you know different ways to approach if you, Yeah, if you have an idea, send it in. We'd love to hear about it. And if you're a premium listener, send it to us at premium at MacGeekab.com. Uh, of course, that's where all your questions as a premium listener go as well. Because if you help us keep the lights on, we answer your questions first. It's just sort of how it goes. Uh, John, I want to talk about our next, uh, set of sponsors, if that's okay by you. Oh, okay. All right. I'd like to tell you about Hopsy. Hopsy is this really cool system that lets you have craft beer on tap at home without getting sick of the beer or breaking the bank. So. How do they do this, right? Because you can have craft beer at home with like a kegerator or whatever, but that's a lot of beer to drink of all the same kind. You might not always like to drink the same kind. In fact, if you like craft beers, you probably like to mix it up a little bit. So the people that created Hopsy essentially like married the kegerator with a Keurig. They call it the sub, right? And it sits on your counter. It's small, kind of sits on its side. And then it fits into it these tiny little kegs that hold about a six pack each. And you put them in and you close it up. And this sub thing chills the, the little mini keg, whatever you want to call it, this torp, they call it. But it also pressurizes it and it's got a little tap handle on the front. So you get the sub, you get a couple of these little mini kegs, you get a couple of glasses. And now you have good tasting, cold Draft beer, craft beer, on tap, ready to go whenever you want. Friends come over, boom, you're ready to go. Sit down, listen to Matt Geek Gab. You've got craft beer ready to go. And here's the thing, the sub, the the little two little kegs, right? The two six packs worth of kegs and two glasses, 99 bucks. Yep. It's crazy. Really good price point on this really cool thing. And you know, I've had one of these at home for a little bit. They uh, sent us a couple of IPAs to test with because I kind of like the IPAs when I'm going to drink beer. That's the kind I like. I like it sort of hoppy. And man, these beers were great because they're craft beers from your local region. So not only does that mean that you're getting stuff that not everybody can get, but you're also getting stuff that's fresh because they're shipping it to you locally. Such a cool thing. So much fun. So easy to use. I really mean it. It's like Keurig for beer. So cool. So you got to check it out. Here's the deal. You go to tryhopsy.com slash MGG. Again, that's tryhopsy.com. T-R-Y-H-O-P-S-Y.com slash MGG. And use promo code MGG to get the sub home draft machine two mini kegs of beer that are equivalent to about two six packs, two hopsy glasses and free membership in their monthly beer club for just 99 bucks. It's true. Just 99 bucks. Terms and conditions apply. Again, it's T R Y H O P S Y.com. Try hopsy.com slash M G G coupon code M G G our thanks to hopsy for sponsoring this episode. Our next sponsor is someone you've heard about for a long time here on Mac Geek Gab, and that is Cashfly. We have been using Cashfly to, as you know, get all of the content from us to you, right? That's how the show gets to you. You download Mac Geek Gab from Cashfly. They 
run a distributed content distribution network that is planet wide and they know what they're doing. Now they're doing even more. They know that when websites don't load, we lose interest, right? People fade off. It's not good. Fewer visits means fewer customers. Bad. Cashfly has your back, just like they have ours. With their new web optimization capabilities, all your content will be optimized before it's delivered to your visitors without requiring any extra development efforts from you. They've done some cool things here with their web content optimization at Cashfly. Powerful APIs for solving all your content distribution problems. On the fly, next generation image optimization to make things look good and be small. Application load balancing, smart asset delivery. They've been doing this longer than we've been doing Mac Geek Gab. They've learned a few things. They're now applying that and letting you take advantage of it. So if your website is directly tied to your revenue, and I can't imagine it's not, optimize your site's content now. Guarantee the best user experience for all of your customers, no matter where they are or what device they're using. And here's the thing. The good people at Cashfly are even going to provide a free optimization consultation for Mac Geek Gab listeners. You got it free for you because you're a Mac Geek Gab listener. So... Know exactly where your site stands today with a Lighthouse score report and learn how Cashfly's web optimization solution can help add 60 points instantly to your score. Just visit mac.cashfly.com. That's M A C dot C A C H E F L Y dot com. And I know I've said this hundreds of times, but I'll say it again. Our thanks to Cashfly for sponsoring this episode. John, it's time to go to the forums, shall we? Sure. Tyler Ver in the forum says, my 2013 MacBook Pro is having a kernel task issue. I have tried an SMC and PRAM reset, uh, an OS restore, and now a nuke and pave with iStat menus. Uh, he says, I can confirm there is no, there are no temperature issues and can use SMC fan control to set the fans to run based off of the temps so the fans slow down. But with the CPU being sucked up by kernel task, my Mac is useless for what I need to do. Before, this, before I junk this laptop, uh, is there any good advice to be had? Yeah, so here's the thing. And, and there's some great answers in the forums that anybody having this should go and read um, far more than, than we can share here. But um, one thing I will throw out there is I noticed this happening on my 2011 MacBook Air. And it started driving me crazy, just like you, because it basically rendered the machine useless. And for whatever reason, I thought to turn on CPU frequency with iStat menus in the menu bar. And this displays the current frequency of the CPU clock. So when you buy a computer, you know, it says, oh, it's a, you know, whatever, a 2.3 gigahertz or a 4 gigahertz i7 processor, whatever that is, quad core, great. But it doesn't always run at the same frequency um, for power savings and heat, dis or heat savings and all that stuff. Uh, the CPU frequency actually moves all around and the computer can control this, right? It can do things depending on the CPU model, like turbo boost, but it can also just throttle itself down. Well, when I turned on CPU frequency, anytime I was experiencing this issue, my CPU would show 800 megahertz instead of, for me, something right in the two gigahertz range on, on that machine. And we talked about this and it was, for me, it was happening mostly when my battery got to 5% or less, it would throttle down. Presumably it would do that so that it had a predictable current flow as the battery got low and you wouldn't wind up with the scenario where the battery just died. So it makes sense. For me, there were times though, where I would put it to sleep, I'd put it on charge, I'd wake it up and it would never wake out of this 800 megahertz mode. So at least I knew by having it in the menu bar, just reboot, everything was good. That may or may not be your issue, but it's certainly worth looking at. And, uh, and see what happens. An SMC reset is another uh, good thing to do, but it sounds like, actually, I don't know that you did that yet. 
Oh yeah, you did. That was the first thing you tried. Okay. Well, for anyone listening that runs into this, you know, any, when it, whenever it's, it seems like it's hardware, but it might be, you know, software or firmware the SMC reset can do that too. But, uh, thoughts on this, John? I mean, you could glean a little additional information <clears throat> by going to activity monitor and highlighting kernel task. And when you highlight something, you get a couple options here. One is it shows me the uh, memory statistics here. And I wonder if you've changed your workflow in such a fashion that you're now stressing out kernel task and it thinks it needs to do something in order to... Uh, you know, as far as like memory allocation, because kernel task is responsible for that among a ton of other things. But will you see that in as well, kernel shows, task, though? I don't. Well, it shows a tab here. So it's a, I'm just looking at mine right now. My sure. mini, and it says kernel task. It says real memory size, 2.8 gigs. OK, virtual memory size, 71 gigs. Whoa. Um, <laughs> I don't have that much memory here. Because I, I thought kernel <laughs> task was io right i mean if you have io spiking you will see kernel tasks also also spike right yeah it has the and it has a, a statistics tab as well maybe that one is more important where it shows you know system calls unix page ins a lot eh, i mean a lot of this may not be yeah i don't understandable I, by mere motor so yeah nice that, but um i mean it will show the the you know the number of threads and wake ups and how long it's been running and stuff percent of CPU, but um, yeah. another thing to look at, I'm going to send you folks to the terminal for this is, um, no, oh, is it there? Did they take it out? Oh, seriously? I think they took it out. I was going to send people to the terminal to run the top command at, which is still there. there anymore. No, no, no. Okay. Tops there. But um, what terminal, what, what our version of top, at least on this machine, which is high Sierra, uh, does not have an IO. It doesn't have a CPU by IO sh broken out. And that's a really handy thing, but you can't do it on a Mac. So m maybe there's a version of top you could run that you could install with homebrew or something. But being able to see if the system is IO bound, how much of the CPU is being held up by input output operations, like especially disk access can be really, really handy. But, um, but I'm not seeing that in the version of top that, that at least not that I'm running here. Let's see, does H top do it? I don't think so. Nope. Well, that was, uh, I guess I, I only do that on our Linux machines and I just assumed it was there on Mac OS. So yeah, kernel task is, I, I mean, I've always thought of, and maybe I'm wrong about this, but I've always thought of kernel task as sort of the thing that reports when other processes are using system resources, right? So again, like disk access gets assigned to kernel task, but it's not kernel task that's using it. It's, you've got some process that's, you know, writing to the disk or reading from the disk. And because it asks the system to do that, that shows up as kernel task um so and and of course then for this throttling thing it can also use kernel task to just account for the the unavailable cpu sort of artificially is is what'll happen so i guess i guess um i would say he's got to look and and see if I mean, the first thing to figure out is this something the system's doing artificially like throttling your cpu or is it something that the system is doing on behalf of another process to me, it sounds like the throttling thing, because unless you unless you know you've got something, you know, just beating on your the system's resources, like sending data out a USB port, reading or writing from a drive, you know, something highly active like that. I, I don't know. I, that's that that. But I could be I could be wrong about what kernel task does. That's that, that's always that that interpretation has always fit my my experience but I, I mean that doesn't mean it's right <laughs> so kiwi graham says uh maybe a memory fault or run hardware diagnostics but also that kernel task is a big black box so it can be it it can be mine is mine is running for for uh i'm actually curious for you john too because i'm you know i'm recording the show i'm streaming the audio so 
uh, and there's a lot of audio processing going on actively, my kernel task on this machine is sitting at about 35% right now, which is higher than normal for really? it. Uh huh. No, mine's at 10% okay. on my mini. Do you have nine percent? Do you have core audio D showing up as running? Yep. It's taking five point five. Okay. Because I'm at I'm at thirty percent with core audio D. But again, I'm doing a lot of different there's you know, there's all sorts of things well, yeah, I'm tied just together. Right. Talking. So Right. Well, you are <laughs> recording though. Like you're recording with because you run the oh, backup right, right. recording on that end. So that that's probably, you know, where some of that comes from. So yeah. It's interesting. All right. Uh, also from the forums, a good one from HDH 15 who says, I have some nest outside cameras that send me sound notifications when someone or some animal is approaching the house. It's very helpful in letting us know when a stray cat that we feed is around it says, I really don't want these sound notifications overnight when I'm sleeping. So I have to remember every night on my phone to open up settings, notifications, nest, and turn off the sound switch. And in the morning, turn it back on. It says I've used the schedule. Do not disturb, of course, which would do it automatically. The problem is that there are some notifications, such as things related to my job, that I need to hear as early as 5.30 a.m., which is not a time that I want to hear that a moth has flown by the camera. So in iOS 12, where we can create shortcuts, is there a shortcut that can be created that either, either simply turns the Nest notifications on or off with a Siri command, or one that can be made that will automatically at least open uh, the settings notification Nest so that I can just flip the switch without having to dig through everything? All right. So I dug into this, John. I don't think shortcuts is going to do what he wants. Um, I'm hoping I'm wrong, and I'm hoping that one of you tells me I'm wrong, but I don't think so. Assuming that I'm not wrong, uh, you can invoke Siri and say, open Nest settings. And you, of course, can do this for any app that has settings in the, you know, the settings app. And that will bring you right to the Nest settings screen where notifications are just one tap away. So. It saves you digging through and scrolling and all of that disaster. Um, I did try saying, you know, uh, hey, S lady, turn off Nest notifications. And of course, she replied, sorry, but I'm not able to change that setting. So, you know, there you go. So there you go. Not bad, but like it, it, there are some things that, that Siri can do granularly to get in there and do that. This one, you know, won't go all the way, but... If you find the right path, you can get yourself right there. So it's two taps instead of, you know, five taps and a long winded scrolling. So there you go. What do you think, John? Am I missing something on this? No, I don't no. think so. Okay. That's too bad. That's too bad. All right. Cool. You want to jump to uh, the next one from uh, the forums that you took care of about Mojave and printing? Yeah. Yeah. I was on the forums. Imagine yep. that. <laughs> Since installing Mojave, I cannot print. I have an Epson ET3750. When I select print, I get the spinning ball. I uninstalled and reinstalled the printer. I cannot even access print the printer in system settings. When I select it, I get a spinning ball again. Well, that's not good. That's not so, good. So there's a few things you could try here. And... Uh, um, here we go. First thing is you may want to install, you may want to see if there's a new driver. And I actually did a search for that model of printer and uh, their support page comes up and they actually just updated it in uh, September of uh, 2018. So you may want to check that out. So number one, install a new driver. Number two, then the good folks at Apple have some guidance for us. Um, and the article's called, If You Can't Print From Your Mac or iOS Device. And uh, if you scroll down a bit in it, you will see um, a couple of things we, we've suggested in the past that will remind you again. And this article, actually, I haven't seen this one before, so this actually has, has a lot of different things. Well, it's covering Mac OS and iOS. But one thing you can do is if you go to System Preferences, Printers, and Scanners, you could reset the printing system. And that basically wipes out, or supposedly wipes out all of the guts of printers that you've set up, including jobs and stuff like that. And they even warn they even warn you. This will remove all printers and scanners, including their print jobs and settings. So 
But it sounds like you're not getting too far right now. So that may be another thing to try. The third thing to try, Dave, and this surprised me that they went into this little detail in this article, is they suggest destroying all your printer drivers. <laughs> huh. And they so resetting the printing system doesn't do that? Or it only does well, No, part I think of what that? they're suggesting is that if you're having real issues here, so they say if the issue continues on your Mac after resetting the printing system, take these final steps to remove any currently installed printer drivers. Oh, oh yeah, that makes sense. Okay. And they I'll are stored that. in slash library slash printers. And my assumption is, is that if you then try to install the printer after you've wiped out the drivers, it's going to download the latest hotness. Huh. Because last I checked, Dave, Apple has drive. Uh, the, the, there are drivers that are stored on Apple's site, and the vendors will will provide those. But you can also go to the vendor themselves and download, as I just told you. Uh, you, you can download it from the vendor itself. But I sure. think the intent here is that okay, well, the drivers that are on here are corrupt or screwed up, so just just wipe them out, and uh, and I'll download them again when when I think I need to. Which, if you're going to install the printer afresh or anew, then that. So what should happen? I haven't seen it happen for a real long time on my machine. The other huh. thing is that I seem to recall is that you, you may want to run um, a software update or App Store and do the refresh trick we told you about. Because typically when they update drivers, though I haven't seen it for a real long time, because you know, I don't buy printers that often. <laughs> sure. Every decade or so. Yeah, right? yeah. Oh, same. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But um, it, it, if the drivers are updated... That typically shows up. So you may want to do that rather than downloading it from Epson, because typically what a lot of the vendors do is that it's not just the driver, but it's the the who's he, what's it, photo service, and, the, and they install all kinds of garbage. And actually, looking in the article here, um, one of our uh, uh, members here, Graham, suggests something else that's kind of in left field, but I'll I'll, I'll roll with it. He says another possibility is that an old kernel extension was not removed by the upgrade procedure. Um, oh. And apparently some printer scan drivers uh, also have an associated kernel extension. So I think what he's suggesting... Um, so I guess you look at the same... Yeah. Well, no. The, well, well, the thing is... Uh, all right, so extensions, kernel extensions, are stored in a number of places. Um, my suggestion would be is that if you go to About This Mac, System Report, you then get the System Info system information application and if you go to the software category hey look there's a tab called extensions and that'll give you a summary of all of the kernel extensions on your system and tell you fascinating details about them like whether they're loaded or not the name and the path to them because huh. there's kind of scattered about the, the thing is there are multiple i think it's slash i think there's system library extensions there's home directory so there's like three or four places where you have these kernel extensions but the the system information utility will identify all of them it takes a little while to run hmm. and yeah if you see anything that has the name epson in it you know you may want to you know drill down um you know you probably have to provide a admin password because uh, i doubt they they take removing kernel extensions lightly and that may fix it. And and the claim was that, you know, if it's removed and it's needed again, it should be reinstalled. I right. Guess either. Right. Yeah. When you reinstall it. Yeah. 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 Cool. Cool. But yeah. That is upsetting that, <laughs> that it seems to be associated with upgrading your operating system. All of a sudden you can't use your printers. I not, certainly didn't. Have not problem. surprising. Yeah. I haven't heard of this happening regularly, but you know, I mean, it, there are wholesale changes happening to the system when you upgrade, you know, a major operating system version. Yeah, so. but I, I don't think they made any. No, I, mean, I could be wrong, but I don't think they made any big changes to the whole printing infrastructure. I mean, I think that's been pretty. No, well and quite, done. quite thankfully, my ancient HP, uh, I've got a HP laser jet that also has a scanner in it. And the software for that hasn't been updated since like Mavericks or something. Mm. And it still works with Mojave. Like it should not. It won't. I don't think it would install on Mojave. I don't think it would install on Sierra. Wait, to it's be honest a, with you. It's a laser. Yeah. Well, yeah. So it's it's speaking a uh, uh, no. what HPGL, I guess. It well, it, whatever it's speaking for the scanning functionality or, PC, or PCL, I guess. Oh, okay. I'm talking. I'm not talking. Printing is no problem. It's scanning that 
um, you need HP software to do and no other scan software that I've found will, will talk to it. it I forget what, what the model so is. So image capture will not no. see it? So it's not a Twain or, or ISIS yep. compliant scanner? Okay, it's, it's kind of proprietary. Yep. Um, but it still works. I used it the other day. I much to my surprise, I was like, oh crap, I got to scan these tax forms for Bob. It was like, it's not going to happen. And it was like, oh, oh, still works. Okay. Hold your mouth just right. Don't move. Yep. Okay. So yeah, crazy. Hey, I All got right. a, uh, I got an email from, uh, Tony, one of my clients who said, uh, is there an easy way to get a copy of Safari's saved passwords? And the answer to that question is complex because if you want to say, get a list of them that you could print, I think the answer is no. If you want to get a list of them that are in just a text file, the answer is no, but uh, at least as far as I know, however, all those passwords are stored in your keychain, right? Your login keychain or your iCloud keychain, or really probably both if you're syncing. And they are of the kind web form password. So if you open applications, utilities, keychain access uh, in there, you'll see the login keychain and your iCloud keychain and perhaps any others that you've created. And if you choose the login keychain or the iCloud keychain and sort it by kind, you will see all of these web form passwords, you know, grouped together and you can highlight them. But unfortunately, the file export items option is not available for things of type web form passwords. But you can go in to edit and copy and you can copy multiples. And then you could go to file and new keychain and save them all to a new keychain that you could then, you know, put on a thumb drive or do whatever you want with it to move it from Mac to Mac. Of course, this is only readable by Mac OS and keychain access. But that would be one way to get a copy of them that you could move to another machine without syncing with iCloud and all of that. So depending on how you want to use this copy of your your Safari passwords, that is one way to do it. Thoughts on that, John? Oh, you got to be kidding me, man. Why? <clears throat> I, I kid. I, I no, kid no, you no. I, I'm, I'm just looking. So you go to Safari. You go to passwords and it shows you a list. And actually I have a couple, though I, I'm not currently actively using iCloud sure. Keychain, but I do have a couple of entries in there and it shows you a list of all of them, mm -hmm. except the password is blanked out unless you click on the entry. So right. I suppose you could write a script uh, <laughs> yeah. that could like scroll through the list and take it. Uh, oh, that's true. Because if you right click on it, if you right click on each one in that oh, list in Safari, you get copy, copy website, password. copy username and copy password. So you could do you could oh. you could scroll through each of those three options and slurp them out. Yes. Yes. And also, oddly enough, there's a share with AirDrop. OK. Hmm. That you know, must be bet, new. Yeah. In Mo that must be new in Mojave. Yeah, because I don't see I, that I, on High Sierra here in, in the really? studio. Really? Oh, no. interesting. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So you you maybe maybe uh, able to script it. Yeah. Not um, my first choice. But, and uh, Kiwi Graham and Michael King in the chat room are saying that one password does let you print this sort of thing if you want. And Michael King seems to think that LastPass also will. So. You know, yet another argument for a third party password manager that has features that are different from Apple's and maybe features that you want. So and I will say with the new password manager functionality baked into iOS, I'm really impressed. It's like one password is an uh, equal citizen to, you know, iCloud keychain, which is good. So hopefully with that helps. LastPass, because I've had yeah, situations right. where. For whatever reason, the app that I'm running redirects to a web page. And I'm like, oh, man, stop. But as soon as I get there and I highlight the username field, it's like, oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, you you want to you wanna go to user or whatever in LastPass, right? And I'm like, yep. Yep. <laughs> it's really amazing how they uh, the, uh, the the integration that they do with that is. Uh, oh, it's yeah, I think I was a naysayer to begin with. But, but now that I see more situations where I actually have to in, input a password through a web page rather than, a, oh, it's than an app. Yeah. That's um, great. All right. Moving on to Tim. Tim says, uh, I have a 2011 MacBook Pro that I use for audio recording and production, but I think my USB port is wearing out and failing. 
is there a way to plug my USB audio interface into the Thunderbolt port with a new cable? I keep hearing experts talk about getting specialized cables rather than adapters and dongles, but I can't seem to find this one. It would need to be a USB type B to Thunderbolt one. If not, is there a way to replace an aging USB port or is it time for a new machine? So working backwards, I don't think you want to replace your USB port because I'm pretty sure on that machine it requires replacing the entire motherboard. So mm-hmm. that, that's just not going to be cost effective. So you're right to think about Thunderbolt as, as the option, but there is no such thing as a Thunderbolt to USB cable. In fact, the only thing that there is, is a Thunderbolt to Thunderbolt cable. Now you might see some things that look like cables, Um, but they are in fact adapters, right? It's, it's important to remember that Thunderbolt is like a PCI slot in a tower computer where whatever you plug in there needs to be the interface. So when you plug, if you wanted, uh, if you had a, a tower computer and you wanted to add a USB interface to it, what you would do is you would get a, a USB PCI card and you would plug that in. And then on the back of the computer where you plugged in the card, there would be some USB ports and you'd be good to go. Thinking of Thunderbolt that way, that's exactly what you need. So you're going to get a Thunderbolt to USB adapter. You're going to plug that in instead of a, into a PCI slot into a Thunderbolt port. But you're not going to get a USB B uh, uh, adapter there or a, a port, uh, interface. What, uh, what do we call that? The thing at the end of the cable? I can't, but whatever. The the, the shape of that, it's not going to be that. In fact, it's going to be the opposite of that. It's going to be a USB-A port, and then you will use the same cable that you've always used. And instead of plugging it into the USB-A port on your laptop, you will plug it into the USB-A port on the Thunderbolt adapter, and you're good to go. And, and that way, and you could... Uh, depending on what adapter you get, you know, even if your laptop, I don't remember that one, but I think that one only does USB two, but if you for your printer, you don't need USB three, but if you wanted USB three, you could add that with a Thunderbolt to USB three adapter and you're good to go. So that's, I think that's the answer. It's just always important to remember that Thunderbolt, I always think of it as a level level deeper than the other ports on the outside of the Mac. The other ports have, their adapters uh, already built into them, whereas Thunderbolt lets you go one level deeper to the motherboard and choose what what functionality you want to add. Does that make sense? Yeah, I think so. Cool. So, yeah, maybe I'm going down the wrong path here, but I was looking for a Thunderbolt to USB three hub. I don't think. Well, there would be no hub. You would get perhaps. Well. I mean, we, we call them, I think, I think they have been called Thunderbolt hubs or Thunderbolt docks, right? Where you get a, a Thunderbolt device that has multiple uh, ports on it, you know, and, and mm-hmm. that certainly is a thing. Um, I mean, they call them, uh, you know, they call them Thunderbolt. Do they call them Thunderbolt docks? Yeah. Thunderbolt dock is, is not, not, mm-hmm. not hub, but. Yeah. You know, OWC has their Thunderbolt 2 dock, their Thunderbolt 3 dock, right? Um, And you can get portable Thunderbolt docks that are just like little dongles that have many ports on them. We've talked about all all kinds of these things. So, yep, that's that. But that's not that's not wrong, right? Because you could get a a Thunderbolt to, you know, USB thing that had three USB ports on it and plug your audio device into one and you have two more or one that has a couple of USB ports and an ethernet adapter or whatever you want. You know, it's, it's a beautiful thing. Connects K A N E X is uh, the company that makes a lot of these things for, uh, for Thunderbolt. So it's worth. Okay. Well, I have yet to experience the joy of Thunderbolt, although both my machines surprisingly have Thunderbolt. Yep. I haven't found an application yet. Really? There's, I'm Someday. trying to think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, I do have a video adapter plugged into my mini into the Thunderbolt slash display port, but that's, I'm going to say, not really Thunderbolt. Right. That's not really Thunderbolt. That's right. That's that's mini display port. That's correct. Mm-hmm. Yep. Yep. 
Yeah, it's weird that and Thunderbolt doesn't have its. Well. But um, yeah, I think we were talking. Uh, you know, I should try to get. I, I well, I guess the one of the issues is that you know the the technology is a little pricier than USB three. Like for example, I think I could get a, a Thunderbolt enclosure and plug it into either of these machines for a hard drive, and that would work right right but but again just for the sake of this conversation that wouldn't be a thunderbolt hard drive it would be as you said an enclosure that has a thunderbolt to mm. sata adapter in it yes right, right it just right. just to just to paint the picture for everyone yeah mm -hmm. yeah so no i think for i think for tim what he wants is this connects Thunderbolt to, they call it their Thunderbolt to gigabit Ethernet plus USB 3 adapter. That's the only one I can find that I would even be comfortable recommending. And I use this one. It's great. It's 80 bucks and it it's Thunderbolt and it has a USB 3 and a gigabit Ethernet port on it. And uh, it's, you know, it's great for being portable with like a an old MacBook Pro or MacBook Air or whatever. So, yeah. Yavol. Yeah, well, all right, man. Speaking of gigabits, I don't know if you want to jump to Jeremy that had a gigabit question. Uh, if you can do it in two minutes or less, go. Oh, all right. Whoa, now I'm under the gun here. All right, so Jeremy asked the question, and I think it's a good question because now we're getting to the age of um, different terminology. And he says, now that I have my new Mac Mini Pro, I'm starting to look for other devices that have 10 gigabit Ethernet. I started with devices I already have, and I immediately came, immediately became confused. Most devices I have are 10, 100, or 1,000 megabits per second, which I expected. But then I am seeing in specification things like Switch Fabric 32 slash 48 GBPS, 10 GBPS switching fabric, and 16 GBPS switching capacity. So what exactly does Apple mean when it says that the Ethernet on the Mini is 10 gigabits? Is it all just hype, or is it something that doesn't matter yet because no one else is doing it? It's not like Apple has, hasn't done that before. Yeah. Um, all right, well, here's the answer. So you are now seeing... So the quick answer is that there, there are two things. So one, yes, but the, the port you can get on the newer Macs, you can get what is called a 10 gigabit Ethernet versus gigabit Ethernet, which is more common now. Um, the port of the machines here, a 10 gigabit Ethernet port it means exactly what it says. It can achieve up to 10 gigabits a second if you're using the right cables. It can also do one, two and a half, five, and 10, or at least Apple claims that there it does, over copper. Um, but then I think uh, the confusion comes in is because they're using the same units now. So a lot of switches, including the one that I have now. So Dave, I have a TP-Link uh, TLSG 1024DE. It's a 24 gigabit switch. Now, you may ask yourself, well, does it have the capacity to actually do that much traffic on what I'm going to call a backplane? Um, and the answer is yes, it does, Dave. And, and here's the, the quick math. And, and uh, 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 Jeremy verified this. So I have a 24 gigabit switch. So that means in theory, it can do, it has 24 ports. It can send a gigabit both up and down. And if you do the math, Dave, you know what you get? You get 24 times 2 times 1. What does that equal? 48 gigabits per second. You so your switch, switch could, your switch is capable of transmitting that much data at one moment, if necessary. Correct. And in the Got specification it. for it, so I think this is what Jeremy was looking at. The specification for the switch says switching capacity of 48 gigabits per second. Got I think it. the confusion comes in now because... This has been common for a while because, and, and to me, the assumption is that a switch should be able to do the full bandwidth of whatever protocol in both directions to all ports. Sure. And I just gave you the math here. 24 ports, yeah. one gigabit up and down. Um, and they claim to be able to do that. So if I did want to blast that much data between all of the ports up and down, uh, they claim that they can handle it. So you're going to, the, the, the problem is the terminology for this is, is uh, so uh, TP Link calls this switching capacity, but he saw other terms used for the same sort of thing. And it's also represented in gigabits per second. Got it. So I can, I can understand the confusion. Okay. So switching capacity and switch fabric are the same thing is what you're telling us here. Yes, it, it, it sounds to me like the vendors are using different terminology to describe the same thing, which is what is the maximum capacity of yeah. this router or switch? That makes sense. And in theory, 
Yeah. It should be. Though I, I suppose if 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 they went on the cheap, you could have one that cannot handle full bandwidth up and down on all ports at all times. Sure. And in sure. my opinion, um, you shouldn't buy a switch that can't do its best. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, that was four minutes, but you know, good. And, yeah. Uh, and helpful. Yeah, I tried to try yeah, to condense no, that was it. Good. But, um, that was good. Yeah. Yeah. I knew it would really checked be the two price. Minutes. Now the thing is, I checked the pricing. And I think even TP-Link has like a 16 port. Uh, the thing is, be careful. Number one, it's pricey, man. I saw like the the uh, like a 16 port TP-Link 10 gigabit switch was like a thousand bucks. Oh yeah, I looked online. Well, because it's got to. I mean, if you want to be able to use 10 gigabits per port, it's got to be able to do you know 160 gigabits, right? Yes. So and the other thing is, at least the TP-Link models that I looked at. You may have to upgrade your copper. They claim that they'll work with Cat 5e or Cat 6 up to a certain length, but then if you want to go farther, you got to get, I guess, Cat 6 or Cat 7 cable. Got it. So, um, unless you really need 10 gigabit, I mean, it's nice to have, but unless you really need it, I mean, you, you may be talking rewiring things. Well, there are buying... some switches that just have like one or two 10 gigabit yes. ports on they them. They had one as well. Yeah. So it had like two 10 gig ports and then like a certain number of one gig ports yeah. and that would be another thing if if well especially if you only have right you know one or two devices which at this point now i mean the mac mini and the mac pro i guess or the uh, imac pro are the yeah, only your synology right might now. do that too so you know like that and that would be the thing right is is think about how you're going to use this this bandwidth does it make sense for your you know what is your mac mini going to talk to that it needs to be able to pump 10 gigs in, in either direction simultaneously. Whereas your Synology, if it's, and, and if a Mac mini is going to be used as a file server, it might need the same thing, but the Synology might actually be talking to several devices at once, each of which are gigabit devices. Well, if you know, you've got three Macs that are gigabit devices and they all want to, you know, send and receive data to your Synology, then it makes sense to plug your Synology into the 10 gig port so that each Mac could then get one gigabit uh, dedicated, you know, uh, not dedicated, but uh, available Does mine have to it. Ten? No. So, this so anyway, all right, now we're, uh, we're, we're pushing past five minutes on this one. So we'll, we'll, we'll call it a day, but uh, shut it down next week, folks. It's, uh, you know, it'll be Cyber Monday when the show comes out. So we are doing our uh, cool stuff found gift guide, or at least the, the first of them for the season. We tend to do a couple here because we know that you know that a lot of the stuff that we put in our gift guide isn't necessarily stuff you would buy for other people. It's stuff you'd buy for yourself. So it either means that you wait until after the holidays to, you know, see what you got, see what you had to get for other people, see how much money you got left, and then maybe have some fun uh, on your own. Or if you're like me, you buy yourself something and put it under the Christmas tree to Dave from Dave and, you know, you're good to go. So <laughs> there you go. I do that every year, every year. Why not? Oh, I always I always buy myself presents. Correct. Yeah. Correct. Absolutely. So, so. Uh, John, prep your stuff for the gift guide. If you have stuff for the gift guide, send it in to us. We'd love to see it. You can, uh, you know, we told you the email addresses earlier. You can send it to us in the forums if you like at macgeekgab.com slash forums. You can call in 224-888-GEEK. John, geek is? four three three five. I want to thank Cashfly again, times two now, both for providing all the bandwidth to get the show from us to you and for sponsoring us with their new uh, web content optimization engine. Of course, the other sponsors in the show include great things like smilesoftware.com slash podcast, otherworldcomputing, maxsales.com, barebones software at barebones.com, ring at ring.com slash mgg, Ops Genie from Atlassian at OpsGenie.com, O-P-S-G-E-N-I-E, Eero.com slash M-G-G, TryHopsy.com slash M-G-G. So very cool. So very lucky. Thank you to all of you for listening, doing what you do. It's Thanksgiving week, so thanks to you, John, for doing the show together for all these years. It's a blast. I love getting together every week and chatting geek with my buddy it's good 
What do you have to say, Mr. Braun? Well, it's probably time to start thinking about this. Um, the holiday season approaching us with Thanksgiving and then some other things, depending on what you're into. But um, it typically involves a supreme being or other force, whether it be an elf or a fat guy with a beard, watching you. So you want to make sure at this time of year that you don't get caught.